Hi everyone, I'm uh, Rachel Warriner, I'm British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow here at the Coursehold um, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event uh, embedded in the history of the post silences, reclaiming legitimacy in the work of Grada Colomba um, with Dr. Catherine Bishop Sanchez. Uh, this event is co-organised by the Coursehold's Gender and Sexuality Research Group and Coursehold Contemporary. Um, we're really pleased to have Catherine here to talk about Columbus' practice, especially because it coincides with the installation of Columbus' work, Obako the Bosch, at Somerset House, in collaboration with the 154 Contemporary African Art Fair, which opens there tomorrow. As Catherine will discuss, Columbus' political practice examines questions of colonialism, its relationship to discourse, memory, and trauma. With her training in psychology and psychoanalysis, her expertise as a scholar of post-colonialism and as a performer and writer, Columbus' work is multifaceted and a complex challenge to those structures that uh, support and perpetuate injustice. The work that is installed at Somerset House exemplifies these concerns, and we're so excited that Catherine is here to talk more about this important work and share her research on Columbus' practice. So, in a moment, I'm going to briefly introduce Catherine, who will speak for about 30, 40 minutes, um, with an opportunity for questions afterwards. After that, we'd like to invite you for a drink in the Research Forum seminar room, uh, which is just down the hall. Um, so, to introduce Catherine prof properly, uh, she's Professor of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her main areas of research and teaching are the cultural and literary representation of race and ethnicity, Portuguese literature of the 19th and 20th centuries, and performance in transatlantic context, Portuguese-speaking Africa, and the Portuguese diaspora. Her first book, Unmasked Utopias, on the representation of the noble savage in art and literature, was published by the Portuguese National Press in 2008, and her second monograph, Creating Carmen Miranda, Race Camp and Transnational Stardom, by Vanderbilt University Press in 2016, and she's uh, very kindly brought a copy with her, so if you want to have a look, come and find me and I'll show you. Uh, it looks amazing. Um, her critical edition of Essa de Cuera's translation of Philidor uh, was published by the Imprenta Nacional Castamurda in 2021. Uh, she was invited to editor for the Portuguese Literary and Cultural Studies the other 19th century um, and performing Brazil essays on culture, identity and performing arts um, in 2015. She's executive editor of the Lusa Brazilian Review and edits a book series at Vanderbilt University Press, Performing Latin American and Caribbean Identities. Since 2018, she is an affiliate, affiliated member of the Centro de Literatura Portuguesa de Faculdade de Letras at Universidade de Colombo, Portugal. Um, so this talk is part of a book project that examines performance with the transatlantic triangle of Portuguese-speaking Africa, Portugal, and Brazil, tentatively titled Performing the Portuguese Diaspora, Race, Slavery, and Belonging. So uh, let's welcome Catherine. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and I'd also like to thank Joel Fornes over at the Somerset House who put us in, in touch so that I would be able to come and give this talk today. And I want to thank you for coming out um, to listen. Um, what I will be talking about on um, the work of uh, Garada Quilomba. And I really appreciate you, you being here, and I hope that we'll have a lovely discussion afterwards. I know we'll have a nice reception, so we have that to look forward to. I would also like to thank um, Acacia for the, um, the logistical help. I don't think she's here, but she was uh, instrumental in getting this set up, and also my university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Graduate School, for allowing me to be, to be here and being absent. I'm supposed to be teaching at this, at this time. So what I plan on doing, and I'm happy to share my, my PowerPoint with any of you afterwards, so, um, and, and also the talk once it's in a better shape, right now it's still a work in progress, um, so just contact me, have my email, and um, easily Googleable um, if you, you want to get in touch afterwards as well. What I was thinking of doing in the time that we have is first I will do an overview of the work of Gerard Quilomba because um, beyond the, the Portuguese speaking world is where I'm situated and where I work. Um, I don't think she is very well known. Um, and, and then I want to talk about this, uh, the work that is here in the installation at the Somerset House. And then just to give you um, perhaps a taste of what I'm working on in this whole project, I will just indicate a few other artists that are working feel in, with, who have work that I feel really dialogues with, with Grada uh, Quilomba. I want to start with this, with this quote. Sometimes I fear writing. Writing turns into fear. 
for I cannot escape so many colonial constructions. In this world, I am seen as a body that cannot produce knowledge, as a body outside place. I know that while I write, each word I choose will be examined, and maybe even invalidated. So why do I write? I have to. I am embedded in a history of imposed silences. These are the opening lines of Grada Quilomba's art video, While I Write, and from which I drew the title of this presentation, Embedded in a History of Imposed Silences. As we know, millions of enslaved Africans were deprived of their identities and their humanity during the colonial times. Approximately 5.8 million in the Portuguese-speaking Atlantic slave trade alone. <coughs> Af Africans who to this day continue to be mostly invisible in the retelling of these stories. As Michel Olaf Trouillot writes in the preface to Silence in the Past, the production of historical narratives involves the uneven contribution of competing groups and individuals who have unequal access to the means for such production. The power in the story, to continue with Trouillot, is what is essential to expose, for history really reveals itself only through the production of specific narratives. Or, as Joseph Roach suggests in his discussion of memory and history as forms of cultural transmission across time, they, and I quote, function as forms of forgetting. Cultures select what they transmit through memory and history. Silences haunt all levels of slavery narratives erasing identities, and impeding the retrieval of these stories. While it is difficult, if not at times impossible, to reconstruct these narratives and assemble facts that have been buried in the past, the 21st century, in the 21st century, new initiatives have emerged that further this endeavor. I want to show you this example. Uh, there's many different sites that we can on, on the internet, but this group of scholars, enslaved.org, I think they're doing some amazing work. Um, and in particular, I wanted to show you just like this, um, this group, um, because their mission is to humanize the study of, of enslavement by centering on named individuals. It is necessary to write these alternative narratives in order to create new perspectives, at times only possible through an appropriation of power and privilege to follow through with their creation and interpretation. Artists, along with scholars and historians, in their own way, can pay, play a significant role in making these silences speak for themselves retrospectively. This is where the work of artists, such as Grada Quilomba, becomes pertinent and even urgent. Grada Quilomba was born in Portugal, with roots in Angola and Santo Domingo Principe. Her interdisciplinary work uses performance as a decolonizing tool. Garane Quilomba moves between artistic creations and praxis, video installations, video art, stage readings, art installations, and academic writing and knowledge, often returning to the same themes of who can speak and on what, topics such as trauma, memory, racism, her performative and theoretical interventions create a provocative hybrid space through which to decolonize thought and relations of gender, race, class, the Western versus the non-Western, myths of civilization and barbarity, the perceived hegemony and superiority of Eurocentric and Western knowledge systems, etc. Performance as a means to decolonize or to decolonize through performance is central to Gerada Quilomba's work. Now, I just want to mention that Quilomba in Portuguese is, um, she takes that from Quilombo, which is um, a community of runaway slaves. Um, and I just remember that I hadn't put that somewhere in my talk, so I just remember that's the, her, her last name that she's taking. The impetus to recuperate a legitimate place for and through the body, the black body performative, and the ability to express the colonial experience and its legacy from the point of view of the oppressed is a constant theme in Grada's work. As Barreiros and Moreira write, Grada Quilomba's intersectional work responds to the contemporary urgency for decolonization in general, and knowledge and imagination in particular, placing her praxis 
within a healing movement of futurity. And I want to show you just three examples of her work prior to the quote that I'm going to be discussing in more detail, just as in, in this overview as, as background. Why I write is the third sequence in a series of short video clips that question who has the ability to speak and be heard. The other two videos are while I speak and while I walk. These are videos where the main element is the visual element of the word, and that indicates the apparition of an individual historically silenced by colonial narratives. And this, uh, this series of videos was first um, screened at the Sao Paulo in Brazil um, Biennale in 2015-2016. These clips highlight certain images and concepts present in her compilation of short, short stories, Plantation Memories. And if you're wanting to start reading some of her work, some of her more theoretical work, I do recommend this book, um, Plantation Memories, that she wrote in English. And that's why you have the two dates. 2008, it was her dissertation, her PhD dissertation, um, in 2008, and later translated into Portuguese in 2019, and it's also exists in other languages. Um, so Plantation Memories and the corresponding stage reading, and here I've just given you some clips, some screenshots of the stage reading, touched on themes such as racial discrimination, um, racial discrimination in higher education, for example, uh, racial discrimination in regards to hair politics, trauma, social silencing, and there's also a very interesting chapter on the mask with reference to the mask that the enslaved um, were, were forced to wear, also um, the, um, that silenced, silenced them. And here we have a quote from Plantation Memories. It is a violent shock that suddenly places the black subject in a colonial scene where, as in the plantation scenario, one is imprisoned as the subordinate and exotic other. Unexpectedly, the past <coughs> comes to coincide with the present, and the present is experienced as, as if one were in that uh, agonizing past. As witnessed throughout Granada's work, and the conjunction of the title, the two words of the title, Plantation Memories, explicitly reference, Daily racism is not a mere reenactment of the colonial past, but a current, recurring, and constant reality, a traumatic reality, deeply rooted in our communities, and that continues to haunt all aspects of our society. And then the third example that I want to show you is, um, just in this brief overview, is a three-part series, and the title is Illusions. And this is, these are video performances that have traveled widely, um, and I believe are currently at um, an art foundation, it's a noble art foundation in Cape Cod. And so this is, so the first of the illusions, the first part, is the retelling of the myth of Narcissus and Echo. And the artist inserts music such as Nina Simon's uh, I Put a Spell on You, which in, the artist interprets as the spell, perhaps of white um, supremacy. <laughs> And so um, what Grande Quilomba does with these, this series is she delivers a performance using the traditional, um, the, the African tradition of storytelling um, in, in this narration. And so in each of the, and let's see it better on the next, on the next slide, on the second, on the, which is to your, to your right, um, um, this is always like a two-channel video projecting. Um, so you have Grande who is narrating, and then you have the the performance on the other on the other screen, and so the first one is, is like I mentioned, is Narcissus and, and, and Ego, and then the second one was Oedipus, and there we have Gerada, and you know, Gerada is Gerada is one of the protagonists, and then the third one is um, the story of Antigone, and, and so this reenactment of the story of Antigone, who against the will of her uncle and the new king Creon uh, wants to give her murdered brother a dignified um, burial. And so in all three cases, so in these solutions one, two, and three, it's just this absolutely stunning um, performance, this staging of, um, of blackness, of black, all black uh, cast, and against this white backdrop, the white performative cube, um, with beautiful hints of texture through orange and, and red and, and different materials, and always the two, the two um, video channels. From the last narration, that's like another, um, that's also from Illusions 3. 
It's absolutely beautiful. From the last time I reached, I just want to read, perhaps I won't read both of these quotes, the, the first one, which is the, the opening statement that Granda, as the narrator, um, begins Illusions 3, and she, she says, what if history has not been told properly? What if only some characters have been revealed as part of its narrative? And what if the ghosts of the past are spirits that are doomed to wander precisely because these stories have not been told? And what if our history is haunted by cyclical violence precisely because it has not been buried properly? This is very similar to what we read in Joseph Roach's Cities of the Dead. The ghosts of the sacrificed still haunt these historic sites of the Circum Atlantic. Effigies accumulate and then fade into history or oblivion, only to be replaced by others. Tortured voices, disrupted languages, forced idioms, and interrupted speeches, and I am surrounded by white spaces. That again is from While I Write, the first um, example I, I, I showed you. These white spaces is what Grada transposes and denounces in the stage and screening of the series Illusions. So against this backdrop, and again, this is just a very brief introduction to, to Kilomba's work, I want to now focus on the boat, which, um, as, as Rachel mentioned, is currently at the Somerset uh, House, and it will be there through October 20th. And, and I, I heard, I was told today, that he may not be traveling anywhere else after um, this setting in London, so it's a, a unique opportunity to see it if you're, if you're able. Galana Quilombo's boat is an artistic installation of performance that can be characterized as speculative, denunciatory, and self-reflective. It essentializes the black experience of the slave ship. Whoops, and I should, we should be looking at this. Sorry. Um, the, of the slave ship and white colonialism. Following Aristotle's view expressed in his poetics, as Richard Sessioner points out, theater, a here applicable to performance, did not so much reflect living as essentialize it, present paradigms of it. The boat, Grada's installation, by its imposing arrangement of wooden blocks representing the hold of a slaving ship and the musical choreography that accompanies the installation, projects a collage of visual symbols and messages to redress history and contribute to a larger picture of colonial tales that have mostly been overlooked, and that have mostly overlooked the black legacy and experience, or co-opted, interpreted, and censored black stories. Grana Quilombo's work is essential to reverse the collective silence of Portugal's racialized past, and it could be Europe's also, a racialized past, through a scenario that, to borrow from Diana Taylor, makes visible what is already there, the ghosts, the images, the stereotypes that haunt our present and resuscitate and reactivate old dramas. It is a performance that blends several dimensions of art that Taylor designates as performance art, body art, live art, action art, with a clear artivist agenda that summons the tools of performance to fight for political change. The message of the boat is clear. The now of its performance captures the ongoing racial disparities and violence that persist in our societies. It is an urgent reminder that the oft-referenced legacy of slavery has concrete and real wide-ranging consequences. And it is a testament to honoring lost lives and a call to action. Grana Quilombo's boat, like most of her aesthetic creations, expresses her commitment to further what Christina Sharp has coined wake work. So fitting with the boat is this installation, as Christina Sharp theorizes, the wake can be understood as the track left on the water's surface by a ship, the disturbance caused by a body swimming or moved in water. It is the air currents behind a body in flight, a region of disturbed flow. Christina Shaw proposes that one aspect of black being in the wake as consciousness is to occupy, and to be occupied by the continuous and changing present of slavery's at yet unresolved unfolding. Her main point is to ask, what if anything survives 
this insistent like exclusion, this ontological negation, and how do literature, performance, <coughs> and visual culture observe and mediate this unsurvival? From this perspective, we can interpret the boat as a forum that occupies and invites its spectators to occupy this slavery's unresolved unfolding, all by mediating the unsurvival of black exclusion. Most pertinent to Grada's installation is Schaub's discussion of the hold. She has a full chapter in her book on the hold of the, the slave ship, the book inhabits us and by which we are inhabited. It is a site where violence is the first language of its keepers, the language of thirst and hunger, heat, language of the gun, language of the foot, the fist, the knife, and the throwing overboard. In this wake work space, is that space is an agent with the, within the drama of Portuguese history. Granada's boat has traveled. It has traveled from Berlin, where it was first envisioned, created, rehearsed, to the docks of Lisbon, then to Barcelona, and on to Baden-Baden in Germany, and now London. And all of these sites, which is very interesting, have intricate links to the slave trade. Um, Somerset House, the, the home of the, the Navy office, um, and even Baden-Baden, close to the, the Black Forest, where lots of the wood to build the ships um, was, was taken. And, and I'll talk more about the situation with, with, with Lisbon. Um, but it's interesting that this, this space is very important, and as I mentioned, becomes an agent within um, this installation. And Granada's performance inserts itself in a long, complicated, and complex European history, a performative genealogy, as Joseph Roach um, would say. And as I mentioned, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the original uh, performance that was in, in Lisbon, because I think Granada created this thinking of this site, and of course, you know, with her being Portuguese and the history of, of Portugal. And, and so it was enumerated. Um, on the on this square, which if you're familiar with Lisbon, it's on the um, it's on the banks of the of the river, the river Tagus, and this is a, a new museum, the Museum of Art, Architecture, and Technology, a very wide space. And Rachel and I were talking just before this talk how you need to have a, a large space to be able to um, host this this installation. Whereas this history of the Middle Passage has been predominantly told through through numbers. <coughs> historiographies, often from a quantitative approach, asking questions such as how many enslaved left Africa, how many arrived, how many died at sea, etc. Ghana's artwork aims to articulate a sensation rather than facts. In a recorded interview with Christina Roldão, the artist writer states, we're not working with the fact, we're working with meaning, the subconscious, and that is how the magic of the performance is created, and that is how we enter the collective imaginary. Rather than represent a hold as a closed, dark, confined space, Grada's hold is one in plain view, plain sight, boldly challenging, out in the open, the historical impl implications of the hold, and as Christina Sharp writes, the hold in the contemporary, the racial discrimination and injustices, the continuing present in our societies, the present that continues, the past that continues into the present. Furthermore, in Lisbon, it was installed in a very public space where observers and spectators could view the work and the performance outdoors free of charge. As Grana recalls, in this case, placing the work in a public space was particularly important, a situation that needs to become more frequently repeated in a society where public spaces have typically and traditionally privileged masculine works dominated by male artists that reiterate the tenets of the colonial system. Further up the same riverbank in the direction of the Atlantic, and if you've been to Lisbon, I'm sure that you have visited this, this site, can be found the most prominent of these monuments to the glory days of the discoveries that stand proudly to memorialize this past. This large, rose-tinted stone monument to the discoveries was inaugurated in 1960 as part of the commemorations of the fifth centennial of the death of the Prince Henry the Navigator, who is, a, who is, pictured, who is pictured at the helm of this structure, and the monument is flanked 
by all male discoverers, writers, cartographers, scientists, and dignitaries of the Renaissance period. Capturing again this biased and one-sided view of the past. If this time I return to this monument, it's a very paramatic monument in, um, in Lisbon. And if I have time, I'll refer to it again at the end of this presentation. It is from here, from this riverbank, that the Portuguese caravels departed on their voyages from the late 15th century on, followed by the slave ships heading to Africa and on to uh, the Americas. Turned towards the Tagus, the original geographical placement of the boat, dialogue with both the past and present of this region of Lisbon, interrupting this male-dominated colonial memory symbolically and, and geographically by his very presence along the same riverbank. And as I mentioned, since Lisbon, the boat has been exhibited in Barcelona, Baden-Baden, and now London. And let's take just a uh, closer look at its creation. <coughs> and these are pictures um, here at the, the, the Somerset House. The artwork itself, with the formative segment, um, boldly represents a new perspective of a slave ship's hold. Here you see there are 140 wooden blocks that went through a process of burning and inscription. So it's, it, even this, this process itself was a prequel to the installation and a prequel to the performance. On the, sh uh, the charred blocks, Grada inscribed in gold letters poems that recall lost identities and histories of those enslaved. And here you see, this is from her Instagram account, um, she's retouching it for the, uh, just the, the poems um, just on the, on, the very, on the very blocks. So it seemed it was almost like a ceremonial um, preparation in, in nature. So a, a sequence ritual involved, and so the, the, burning, the, the wood was placed in the ground, burned, so with all the accompanying odors, um, and then the inscription and the dyeing and the drying of the the paint and here the, the rewriting. And I wanted to show you the poem. This is the poem that is on these blocks. And so when you um, when you go to the installation, the each of the blocks in the center, this 14 I believe, um, there's one verse on each of the blocks. So you have like one boat, one cargo hold, then the next block, one cargo hold, one one load. The next one, one load, one story. And so you can read it as you walk around the 14, the 14 blocks. And so each block is assigned a segment of this, of this poem um, in, different, in different languages. And several European and African languages that simulate the international dimension of the slave trade with words that point to the mortality of life and the violence committed against the bodies of those enslaved. And so and just a close up the blocks and then you can read um, one life, <laughs> one life, one body, and on the next one, um, one body, one one person. So, and so this epitomizes the over, overarching mission of the installation. Everybody is a life. The burning of the blocks also adds another sensorial dimension to the installation. The burning creates a lingering smell that reveals in the artist's words, almost a skin, a scar, a wound. These marks are part of a collective suffering, one shared across continents and eras, but ever present in the ongoing and unresolved memory of the, the death entailed by the inhumanity of slavery. The boat, as an installation, goes beyond the physical arrangement of the blocks with their inscriptions that represent the mortality of hum humankind. It is the transposition of the human tragedy that was the slave trade through choreography, chants, music, percussion, and um, a, a chorus. And I, I'm going to skip, I have a couple of quotes here. I'm very interested in how so much has been written about the, the Middle Passage, about the hold, um, and even in this, some historians, but also other theorists. And I've gone back with very, um, I'm very interested in Edouard saw The Open Boat. He has a section on the hold um, in, in the Poetics of Relation. I find um, very interesting. More recently, um, there's some work by Stefano Harney and Fred Moten who write in the undercommons um, that you're never, be, you're never going to be on the right side of the Atlantic. To have been shipped is to have been moved by others, with others, just to feel at home with the homeless, at ease with the fugitive, at peace with the pursued, at rest with the ones who consent not to be one. 
And so there's a lot written about this, this hold that I think um, accompanies very well Grada's, Grada's work. And so the, the performance, and if you're, if you're lucky to see the performance, there's two performances this week I just want to mention um, just a, a, a few words about um, these performances. There are four, actually, there's only going to be three um, in this in the performances this week. Usually there's, there's four, one isn't able to count. So there's, th uh, there's going to be three percussionists um, with their portable um, drums that mark the rhythm of the music or open the cordage. A performance who follow behind. At the forefront of the, the blocks, the percussionist's music beckons the dancers and other performers who then advance through the installation. And they advance with slow, solemn, um, calculated gestures, extending their arms and waving um, props that seem to be like wing, um, wing like props. This is from the uh, Lisbon performance. And there you can see them as they advance through the center of the hold. I think this gives you a good idea of, of some of the, um, the different segments of the, the performance. So you have 14 strong voices. It's a cast of 22, but uh, the performance is 14 in total, um, who compose the chorus. And from the sun poem, several particularly powerful phrases stand out, forming a college of symbols that hark back to what is inscribed on the, on the blocks. Words such as forgetting, pain, revolution, equality, affection, humanity. Um, and, and then echoing what is written on the box, a cargo, a story, a piece, a life, a body, a person, a being. The presence of black bodies in movement were an essential part of the performance as imagined by, by Grada. And not only the black bodies, but a prominence of female performers. And all of these performers um, came from the periphery of Lisbon, where Garada is from, and the original ensemble is coming to Lisbon, which wasn't the case in Barcelona. In Barcelona, um, Garada worked with some local talent and then also some from Lisbon, but they have brought the original um, ensemble for the performance here in, in London. And so there is a prominence of the female black bodies to rectify the lopsided tendency of history that has privileged white male bodies and symbolically and concretely challenge the lack of representation of black female subjectivity in Portuguese polity, or it could be also European. And as Grada states, these are the identities and bodies of black women that have been systematically made invisible on platforms and stages, and that need to be made visible, and have the magic to construct <coughs> the future. Again, that idea of futurity. What about us as, as the audience? What is our participation in this um, installation? The audience is invited to witness, of course, the performance of the dancers, the musicians, and the singers, but is also able to walk around the blocks, read the poem, and physically become part of the experience, co-creators of this revision of history. With the blocks placed at ground level, reading the inscriptions may require the viewer to have to lean over or crouch down. Performance, as Dwight uh, Conkerwood discussed, is associated with feelings, emotions, and the body. And the interactive nature of the boat enables the audience to experience the exhibit more intensely as a visceral experience. And here you can see, this is um, here at the, the Somerset, the um, viewers looking at the reading the inscriptions on the um, on the, the wood, and then the second picture there. And this arrangement purposely creates a possibility of physical discomfort. Um, as the public interacts with this space, that should also provoke emotional discomfort, as the viewer recalls the associated history and the slave ship recreation um, that makes its imprint on a new collective imaginary. But I'm also seeing in this picture, I'm just noticing now, there's also scenes of them always reverence, you know, like they're almost kneeling in front of the, the, the blocks. And I think that is um, interesting. This interaction, as Diana Taylor has discussed, precludes a certain kind of distancing and places spectators within its frame, implicating us in its ethics and politics. The spectator interaction and the proximity to the wood, to the engravings, 
um, breaks down the distance and moves away from the tradition of wireism that is often be present through um, what Williams referenced as the one-way gaze of the soberly disengaged. The work then can be seen as an invitation to a new journey, one that draws from a genocidal past and directly transposes the reality of its inhumanity and gives presence to those it erased through this very open public forum. And so um, what I want to I want to skip um, and just briefly just to conclude a few examples of other artists. And this will be a, just a brief overview. I wanted to show the work um, of these three um, artists, creators, um, who staged the play Dark Dawn. And it was a watershed in, in Portuguese theater, not only because it was created and performed by these three black um, actresses, but also um, because it was a direct message against discrimination and decolonization in Portuguese arts and, and society. And it was staged at one of Lisbon's main theaters, um, the Dona Maria Second National Theater. And so that's why it was so um, interesting. And that was in 2019. I promised to circle back to this monument. And in relation to this play, I brought the play um, Dark Dawn because I wanted to just um, show you this. This is the advertisement for the play. Again, this is the monument, the monument to the discoveries. And in this photo performance that was advertising the play, I just think it's very interesting how um, they, it, it embodies the main message of the play, which is giving visibility to bodies that have been erased, deprived of the possibility of telling their own narratives. And the copy of the, um, of the publicity says, to create, to, to celebrate the men who have accomplished great conquests for the nation, it is necessary to also celebrate the mothers who held in their arms their children killed by the men who accomplished great conquests for the nation. Only then will history be complete. Another example, again, this is also this monument. So if you go to Lisbon now, you'll be seeing that uh, monument perhaps with different eyes. Um, this, this monument, um, this photography, this was a, a photography done by Yuanji <coughs> Kia um, Henda. And what, what is interesting here, and I don't have time to really discuss it in, in depth, but he names this the discovery. And it was 15 uh, youth came from the periphery and placed on the monument. Um, this is 2000, 2007. Another work, and this is um, a work that has its forthcoming. Um, Kiloanji, the same artist, um, he won a competition for the What Will Be the Memorial to the Enslaved in, in Lisbon, but um, this has not materialized yet. And the, the, the title is The Plantation, Prosperity and Nightmare. In Portuguese, that's a beautiful three word uh, alliteration, Plantação. Prosperidad y um, um, and But I think the last two words um, was more working titles. Uh, so it's going to be the plantation. So what we see, the plantation, of course, the place where the ideology of slavery uh, where it was implemented, but also the plantation that fueled, you know, the money that fueled the slave trafficking in the money bags of the, um, the big house, the, the master's house. And, and what is interesting in this um, installation is this is a plantation in mourning. This is a dark, this is a black plantation. And, and this was, um, it's a very, it's, it's going to also be um, on the riverbank. This is the installation where it is planned at a future, a future date. My last example, and this I will conclude, um, comes from Brazil. And this is Arison Eraclito, um, who does a really fast, he has a lot of fascinating work. But this is a performance. And it's called, um, in Portuguese, it's the sacudimiento, which is like a, the shaking. And it's a ritual that he, um, that he begins in Brazil, in northeastern Brazil, um, in Bahia. And, and it's kind of like a cleansing of um, an edifice, an installation uh, that is related, that references slavery. And then he continues on the other side of the Atlantic, in the island of Goé, um, of uh, of course, of Senegal, and and that he continues this ritual, this this cleansing, um, and I just think it's a very interesting performative um, act uh, on both sides of the of the Atlantic, and so what these these are, uh, installations and these artists um, have in common is this impetus to bring attention, uh, very obviously to, to to slavery, but also this racial violence, 
And, uh, and for this, in societies that for the most part have preferred to veer away from the discomfort of a past that continues to haunt the present. I think it was Patricia Williams that says, um, people who want to, why are we still um, waving the flag of, uh, of slavery? People uh, would prefer to um, pass it by. As Cleo asks, how do we recognize the end of a bottomless silence? This urgent and necessary kind of performance is a part of a larger impulse among those and beyond, as Pierre Nora, Nora writes, marginalized in traditional history, who are haunted by the need to recover their buried pasts. The boat by Gerard Quilomba can be considered a resistive, subversive, but also celebratory performance. And it is through artwork and performances like those of Gerard Quilomba that we are able to reposition ourselves, tell new stories, from new perspectives to create alternative narratives that refuse to be hostages to a silenced, a silenced past. Gerard Quilombo's work is a dark evocation of racism, colonialism, and genocide that resurfaces in contemporary society, past and present, reminding us where we are and ultimately seeking change for the future so that these voices and narratives will no longer be embedded in a history of imposed silences. Thank you so much. And I know you made reference to the performances. Here you have them there. Yes, I'm doing publicity for the Somerset House, but really, I'm so thrilled to see these performances. I hope if you're interested that you'll be able to, to be there. Thank you, and thank you for that. I mean, like, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you also for uh, giving this information on those, because I'm sure everyone will want to go and see them. Um, I'm going to open up for questions, but first I'm going to um, take the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, I was really interested. I love this idea of um, opening up the space for feeling as a kind of political um, practice. And I, I was particularly struck by the way in which, in some ways, the um, gold painting on the black um, wood looks a bit like a gravestone. And I was wondering if there is a... A kind of, does she speak about what do you think anything about the kind of role of mourning in this as a kind of a, um, a, a work in terms of political feeling? You know, I haven't heard her talk about mourning um, per se, um, but she talks a lot about death and mortality. And so I do think we could extend that to, to include mourning, absolutely. I had not thought about that being like the great great stone, but it is, we're inscribing on these blocks of wood. So definitely we inscribe on a gravestone. So I think that's, that's um, definitely um, appropriate. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think that if you're trying to make something individual, then mourning is a kind of a way of um, <coughs> sort of particular feeling for a particular person, I wondered about. Uh, but um, does anyone else have and, things? That, oh, sorry. No, I just want to say it's interesting if when you go, I just went today because I wanted to see it before um, talking to you this afternoon. Um, there is a feeling of reverence, and there's a sign that says, no selfies, please, um, like to, to honor this space. And I re that really touched me because I do, I do think it's um, there's a feeling with this type of an installation. And um, so, absolutely, I appreciate you, you mentioning that. Any questions? Um, anyone want to ask Lucy? Thank you, that was so fantastic. And I was not familiar with her work, so thank you so much for introducing us to other projects as well at the beginning. Um, I was also really struck by that idea of an embodied history, almost, rather than a history of facts and figures. And I was struck, too, by the different viewpoints and perspectives in the images that you showed of the work. So initially that, that almost aerial shot where we're looking down on it and, and certainly from a British educational perspective that's, that felt so familiar to me from the kind of diagrams in high school history books and those diagrams that, that almost abstract the individual human experience of, of slavery and the slave trade. And I, I kind of thought about the way in which we often, certainly in this country, certainly in my education, learned about the slave trade as really a kind of history of, of figures and facts. Um, and the way in which that almost, I am getting to a question, I'm sorry, um, reproduces the kind of uh, the logic of capital that drove the slave trade in the first place. <coughs> and so I wondered if you could say something about the way in which that, that embodied perspective that operates at ground level maybe changes the way in which we think about history as a process 
of learning about the slave trade and the experience of slavery. Yes, no, absolutely. I think, yes, I really enjoyed your comment too. Before the question, I was taking notes. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do think it makes it so much more real and it makes it, it makes it closer to us. And I think that's what embodied performance does. It makes it, um, it, there's not that separation. It really makes you feel it. It's tangible. It's visceral. And, but I want to go back to, you mentioned the, the aerial view. There's those maquettes that we used to see the, exactly. Um, and I, I didn't bring that because, you know, this slideshow is only like 36 slides. And I, I took a, one of those maquettes out just to show how it was, it's parallel to that. Um, Granada had also um, proposed a similar installation for the memorial to the enslaved in Lisbon, and her project wasn't chosen. The Melanges um, <coughs> project was chosen, but in the, the dossier of that um, of the proposal, the PDF, she she puts the maquettes like those images, those like aerial view, I guess, of the slave ship, and, and alongside her. Um, her installation. So it's very, very present, it's there. However, then she works against it. So, I, I, and I think she, pr she provides that. It's also for the jury, perhaps, to understand. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I think she works against that. And she says that very explicitly. I don't want to work with facts. I'm working with the feelings. And almost like the magic of the performance, I think, is the term she uses. So she's, she's doing, you know, she's departing from the facts completely but using them as the base, and then wanting us to have this experience so that we can change the future. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I hope you experience it. Um, and not just the discomfort, but also the reverence. And I, and I saw that just given this presentation, suddenly the people kneeling, I had seen that as discomfort. But as I was speaking, I just thought, no, that's almost people kneel, so, you know, sometimes in churches, right, to pray. So I felt that was also reverence to the... Um, the, the deceased. I've also had students ask, what, do the, what does the wood represent? Which, does anyone have any, any thoughts on like, the, the different wood, the logs? Because when you see the maquettes, it's almost like they have um, like people, right? You know those maquettes, it seems to be you know, the enslaved people in the hold of the ship. So I mean, I just, we can think about it. I don't have an answer. And I shouldn't be asking the questions. I'm supposed to be receiving the questions. But you know, I have a captive audience. I thought, you know, I don't have an answer. So, um, and they say you should present your work early when it's really a work in progress. So you make your mistakes early. So yeah, that's what I'm also doing. Does anyone else have any other things? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And in the performance, and when we talk about performance in the archive, okay, we th we always think about Diana Taylor and, and her work on the on the archive as a performance medium, but. But I think, you know, because the performance is never the same, the performance is fleeting, what is left? What is left at the end is the emotion. And so I think that is what we take away from this performance. However, we do, um, somehow we thought that uh, element of um, the ethereal, the fleeting, because we, we tape and we register and we keep um, records of these performances. However, the fleeting nat nature of it is ingrained in what is a performance. A performance will disappear. A performance will never be the same as the performance before. Um, and in this case, what I would add is that the, the space of the performance has accompanied this, uh, the boat. And I, I cannot do a, a valid comparison to the other sites. But I'm very sure that where the boat is installed and where the performance is carried out will change every time it goes to a new site. And even at the Somerset House, they were discussing this afternoon, um, bringing the performance down from the upper terrace, you know, just, uh, and you're using the site uh, that is there. So again, the performance will change and it will be um, uh, immer memorable, right? It will be fleeting and immemorable. 
Do we, does anyone else have anything they'd like to ask? I mean, if not, it's coming up to six o'clock, so we could move this to a sort of less formal conversation in the Research Forum seminar room. Um, but before we do, let's thank Catherine again. That was such a fantastic. <laughs> I hope you can get to the performances. Great, great. Thank you.